Welcome to our online service here at Every Nation Bryanston. A special shout out to those of you who are visiting us for the first or second time. Do me a favor, if that is you, go ahead and click on the connection card and just fill in your details because we would love to get to know you better and tell you a little more about ourselves. So if you click on that connection card and fill in your details, one of our pastors will get a hold of you uh, during the week so that we can chat to you a little bit and let you know a little more about who we are. We are in week two of our Year of Yes series and we are going to be speaking about the confident life today. Let's get to the message. In 2008, a handsome young man in three quarter slash cargo pants slash tracksuit pants, if your mind can even begin to imagine that piece of fashion, <laughs> proposed to me and he said this to me. He said, I don't have much, but I have Jesus. Despite his very questionable fashion sense, I want you to know that he had me. He had me. He had me at I have Jesus. And even if that was the only thing that he had, that is the thing that I needed the most. That one thing has kept us over the years through trials and tribulations, over the past couple of weeks, having to navigate deep loss, having to fathom disappointment in relationship, having to be in circumstances that are unfavorable. It has kept us that what we have is Jesus. Though we may not have much, we have him. I love God. I love Jesus because he's consistent. Even in the inconsistencies of life, he's consistent. He is so consistent that even when we're not faithful, he manages to be faithful. The book of Philippians gives us a peek into Paul's relationship with Jesus. Last week we discovered that Paul was filled with joy even in his unfavorable circumstances. And this week, as we read this piece of scripture, we will see how confident Paul was. If you have to consider the situation that he finds himself in, and that at this point, Paul had gone through a series of really difficult events, which included being flogged, <laughs> being imprisoned for two years, having a plot to kill him orchestrated against him, escaping from that plot, being um, in difficult situations, including a shipwreck and finally finding himself again in Rome after three mistrials awaiting trial. You would think that Paul would be discouraged and it would make sense. You would think that Paul would be dejected. That would make sense. But Paul in his letter speaks with such joy and such confidence. And let me read so that we can discover together what it is about Paul's relationship that allows him to have this disposition, even in the midst of such unfavorable circumstances. I'll be reading from the Passion Translation, starting from Philippians uh, 12. So Philippians 1, verses 12 to 26. He says, I want you to know, dear ones, what has happened to me has not hindered, but helped my ministry of preaching the gospel, causing it to expand and to spread to many people. For now, the elite Roman guards and government officials overseeing my imprisonment have plainly recognized that I'm here because of my love for the anointed one. And what I'm going through has actually caused many believers to become even more courageous in the Lord and to be bold and passionate to preach the word of God all 
because of my chains. It's true that there are some who preach Christ out of competition and controversy, for they're jealous over the way God has used me. Many others have pure motives. They preach with grace and love filling their hearts because they know I've been destined for the purpose of defending the revelation of God. Those who preach Christ with ambition and competition are insincere. They just want to add to the hardships of my imprisonment. Yet, in spite of all this, I am overjoyed. For what does it matter as long as Christ is being preached? If they preach him with mixed motives or with genuine love, the message of Christ is still being preached. And I will continue to rejoice because I know that the lavish supply of the Spirit of Jesus, the Anointed One, and your intercession for me will bring about my deliverance. No matter what, I will continue to hope and passionately cling to Christ so that he will be openly revealed through me before everyone's eyes. So I will not be ashamed. In my life or in my death, Christ will be magnified in me. My true life is the Anointed One. And dying means gaining more of him. Verse 22. So here's my dilemma. Each day I live means bearing more fruit in my ministry. Yet I fervently long to be liberated from this body and joined fully to Christ. That would suit me fine. But the greatest advantage to you would be that I remain alive. So you can see why I'm torn between the two. I don't know which I prefer. Yet... Deep in my heart, I'm confident that I will be spared so I can add to your joy and further strengthen and mature your faith. When I'm freed to come to you, my deliverance will give you a reason to boast even more in Jesus Christ. So Paul finds himself in prison and his journey to prison is one that has been riddled with a series of difficulties. Paul had been arrested in Jerusalem. Paul had had a couple of Jews plot to kill him because of his gospel work. Paul had been flogged. He had been imprisoned for two years. He suffered a shipwreck. He had had multiple mistrials. And now again, imprisoned in Rome, he is waiting to be on trial. This trial could end in his death. But Paul is filled with joy, but also filled with a deep confidence. He is confident in his mission and he is confident in his Jesus. What is it about Paul that causes him to have such a sturdy, such a grounded confidence, even in the midst of being in prison? Today, I want us to talk about two things that I believe point to why Paul is so confident. The first is this, Paul had a mission. He was clear on his mission here on earth. The second, probably a little more tenuous to speak about because we usually would shy away from speaking about it, but Paul has a longing for eternity. He speaks about longing to be with Christ. I believe that these two things inform Paul's confidence, even as he is in prison. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you meet us in every single situation and circumstance. Thank you that you are faithful and that you are true. And I ask, Lord, that as we go through this word, that you would meet every single person exactly where they're at and speak courage into them that they would find themselves again confident in you, Jesus. Amen. So let's talk about Paul's mission in the world, Paul's mission on the earth. Verse 12, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, there is a confidence that has begun to build up in other saints in their boldness to preach the gospel. 
even as Paul finds himself in this circumstance, it is so clear what his mission is. Paul is writing to the church of Philippi to give them an update of his well-being. And instead of him receiving comfort from them, he comforts them in letting them know that, you know what, I'm doing well. I'm actually thriving. Thriving? Yes, absolutely. Even in prison, I'm thriving because the mission is still at hand, because the gospel is advancing. Paul is so focused on his reason for being on earth. He's so focused on Christ being his reason that even in these unfavorable circumstances, Paul is able to see the hand of God at work. He is able to hold on to the mission and see it come to pass, even as a prisoner. The word serving here, when it speaks about his circumstances, serving to propel the gospel forward or to allow the gospel to progress, this word, when read in the Greek, is, is almost personifying the circumstances in that they have arrived, they have come, they have shown up in order to directly impact the work of the mission going forward. Paul is not allowing himself to spiral into a space of dissonance like we would sometimes do when we feel I've found my mission, I have found my purpose, how is it then that I find myself in a prison? No, Paul even in his prison holds on to his passion for the mission. I love hosting. I really, really love hosting. Um, I love having people over, playing games and eating really good food and just, I really enjoy great company. Between the two of us, that is Siv and I, I am the extrovert. I know it's unbelievable because Siv is, you know, verbose and grand and all of that, but he's actually an introvert and he gets energized by being alone. I love being around people. If I am not in a good mood, put me in a room with people and something just happens to me. Though I love people and I love hosting, there's something about <laughs> uninvited guests or guests who just show up and they haven't told you that they are coming that makes me really, really uncomfortable. When that happens, I usually find myself scrambling, trying to perfect my home and make sure my kids are perfect and make sure the meal is perfect to the point that I miss the opportunity to enjoy the people that have come over. I have to be reminded that you know what, it's more important that you enjoy your friends, that you enjoy your family now that they're here, than for the circumstances to be perfect or the situation to be the way that you would ideally want it to be. So, Paul, even in this unfavorable circumstance, he is able to find it within himself to lean into the mission. And I want to put it to you, this is because Paul's mission is not just focused on him, but his purpose has become so aligned with Christ's purpose that he understands that even prison, even difficulty cannot keep and should not keep the gospel from advancing. He ends off the letter um, in Philippians 4.22 and he says, all the saints greet you, all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. What has happened here is that Jesus's gospel mission, Paul's gospel mission has taken hold even in Caesar's household, even in a place where Paul is a prisoner, he has managed to bring freedom. He has managed to bring salvation, even in his own incarceration. Paul is ever so aware of God's sovereign hand in bringing him to this place. 
He is unwavering in his purpose, unwavering in his mission, even while in chains. I know that sometimes we may find ourselves in our own prisons. And it's difficult, like I said earlier, to conceive that though I have found my purpose, though I have found my mission, why is it that I find myself in what is seemingly an imprisoning circumstance? That prison may be losing a job, that prison may be losing a spouse, that prison may be breaking up with your boyfriend, that prison may be not getting the scholarship or the, or the, the, the bursary that you were looking uh, forward to getting or that you were trusting to get. Because you are convinced that this is my purpose, this is my calling, it may be tempting to you to believe that therefore <laughs> it's going to be easy. I know that I've fallen into that trap where I've felt like, God, I feel like I'm walking in my purpose. Why is it so difficult? Shouldn't it be easy? But we see Paul here uh, not keeping his eyes on the prison circumstances or his incarceration. He's not even allowing his eyes or his focus to shift to those who are trying to preach the gospel to ensure that his circumstances in prison become even worse. Even in that, even in that situation, even with people trying to um, make the, the, the circumstance even more difficult for him, Paul continues to preach the gospel Paul continues to be infused with energy for the purpose. Sometimes, though we are in prison, God doesn't deliver us from our problem, but he delivers us through our problem. We see Paul not trying to escape the situation. On the contrary, we see him living in such a way that others are encouraged to take part in the mission in a more fearless, in a more courageous way. I know that we can, we can be tempted to believe that when we are within our purposes, things should be easy. But even when things aren't easy, I want you to know that it is possible for you to be fruitful. God is a God who will not waste your time. God is a God who will not waste your prison. God is a God who will not waste your problem. God is a God who is able to bring fruit even out of unfavorable circumstances. So when you think about your circumstance this morning, when you think about your unfavorable circumstance this morning, your thinking should not be how do I escape this necessarily, right? If you need to get out of the circumstance that you are in, get out of that circumstance 100%. But as it pertains to your purpose, as it pertains to God's purpose and God's mission, there is an opportunity for you to have a different perspective that allows you to see even in this situation, even in this job that you do not like, how God is able to bring fruit out of you. Paul wasted no time. During this particular incarceration, he wrote um, the book of Philippians. He wrote the book of Ephesians. He also wrote the book of Philemon. Um, along with that, the book of Colossians. He didn't waste any time. He wasn't licking any wounds, but he was still aggressive in his mission. He used what he had and partnered that with his passion for the mission. I don't imagine that Paul thought that these letters that he was writing would be an encouragement to the saints thousands of years later. I want to say to you that you cannot imagine how your perseverance in the mission, the kind of impact it will have in eternity. Paul has the kind of relationship with Jesus that says, for me to live is Christ. And as long as I am alive, even while facing death, 
I'm focused. My eyes are focused like Flint to ensure that I am living out the mission. God was able to bring life out of death in that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died a gruesome death, and where it would seem he was defeated, where it would seem he was ultimately imprisoned, God was able through his spirit to raise him from the dead, bringing life, bringing freedom, not only to him, but to all those who would believe in him. Paul believed in Jesus, believed in this resurrecting power, believed in the mission that Jesus came onto this earth to do. And he put his money where his mouth was. And we see this. We see this that even though he's in prison, Paul continues to preach the gospel. When the mission is clear, there will be fruit. When the mission is clear, there will be fruit. When you know what God's purpose is in your life, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, there will be fruit. And I know that for some of us, we are currently going through really, really difficult circumstances and we cannot imagine how there will be any fruit from the circumstance that we're in. But if the mission is clear, if the mission is anchored in Jesus, if the purpose is anchored in Jesus, then there will be fruit. So I want to take some time to speak to the mission um, a little bit. And the gospel being the mission, God is unwavering about his desire to have all things reconciled to him. God is unmoved in his passion for his creation and having all of creation, including all of humanity, return into perfect relationship with him. That is what Jesus achieved, where there was a gap between God and ourselves. Jesus came and he bridged that gap with his very life. So this gospel is it's so easy and maybe not so easy to look at Paul being so fluent in the gospel and him being so confident about this gospel and this mission and his participation in it. But I want to encourage you in this way. Jeff Vanderstelt has a theory about the gospel uh, which he, he calls gospel fluency. So maybe it's not a theory about the gospel per se, but how we become comfortable with the gospel, acclimatized enough with the gospel that we can use the gospel and speak it into every situation, into every circumstance. He says the gospel is like a language. When you first start to learn a language, you begin by translating it from the language that you are most fluent in. As you progressively become fluent, the gap between the language you are learning and the language you are translating from becomes smaller and more rapid. Then when you are fully fluent in the language, you are able to think in that language and converse easily in it. With regard to the gospel, we are in a process of learning that language. We're all at different parts of our journey. We can look at Paul and feel intimidated that even in his situation, he is able to be so fluent in the gospel. But we're all on a journey of learning. But as we all know, in order to become fluent in a language, you need to immerse yourself in that language. You can't speak it from time to time. You can't read it um, from time to time or only be acquainted with the basics. In order for you to become fluent, it is necessary for you to immerse yourself in the language and not only immerse yourself, but practice the language. Even if you feel the discomfort of not being fluent, the gospel is laden in itself with the power to bring life. 
So even as I'm speaking about becoming fluent, I want you to know that the power of the gospel is not dependent on your fluency. The fluency is for us that we may be able to have a healthy perspective in good seasons and in bad seasons, in seasons where we are ministering to people we like and in seasons where we're ministering to people who we don't like or people we feel are imprisoning us like our bosses. <laughs> Sorry to all the bosses out there, but <laughs> sometimes it does feel like the workspace can be a little bit of a prison camp. But I want you to know that your gospel fluency or the gospel working is not contingent on how fluent you are in the language, but your fluency in the language will allow you to become more confident in your communication. The gospel in and of itself, I, I, I think of it like music, right? That there is nothing that you need to do to cause music to move someone. It's in its very nature that when it is in a space, it causes a shift in the song. The gospel is a lot like that, that it has this capacity that when it comes into a soul, that it, when it comes into a space, it is able to bring a shift and it is able to bring a change. I want to emphasize here <laughs> because I know some of you are thinking, I've shared the gospel with a lot of people and nothing has happened. <laughs> One, do not concern yourself with what has happened or hasn't happened. You need to be diligent in the mission. But two, there is an element where the person who is hearing the gospel needs to partner with their faith and believe. That delicate dance is something that only God can be concerned with. It is not our concern when or how someone responds to the gospel. Our concern is the mission. Our concern is our partnership in the mission, in Jesus' mission with him. What he does with our delivering of the gospel is between him and the person who has heard the gospel. We just need to continue to be faithful in the mission. We've spoken about the mission, and I know a lot of us who are listening are like, good, clear, I know. I know that the mission is the gospel. I know what my mission and what my purpose is, and I'm, I'm about to get about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, Mission alone is not enough. The kind of confidence that we see Paul showing up with is not only based on such a clarity of mission, but Paul has this anchoring in eternity that allows him to know that what he is doing now will absolutely have impact now and in eternity. Paul says this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I don't know. I am torn between the two. I desire, he says, to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. I want us to speak about the second thing that allows Paul to be so confident, and that is a longing for eternity. Paul has tasted of relationship with Christ, and that taste has awakened a deep longing in him, so deep a longing, so superior a longing, that even death cannot make him afraid. Even death cannot keep him from this deep longing. At our core, we're all made up of longings. At least I believe this. I believe to be human is to long. To be human is to crave. To be human is to have desires. We all have longings to be seen or a longing to be heard and understood. 
we all have perhaps a longing to succeed or a longing to be held and comforted, a longing to um, be powerful or even a longing for self-mastery. This is, this is part of the human experience. Longings are like seeds and they are filled with potential. They are filled with this desire to, to take root and bind. In and of themselves, there is nothing wrong with having a longing. A longing. However, sin enters the picture and it corrupts. Sin will often appeal to legitimate appetites and ordinary desires, causing a desire for God to be obtained in a way that is not good. We see that with Adam and Eve. They had a desire to be like God, but they obtained that desire in an incorrect way. We also see that because of the impact of sin on humanity, sometimes our natural desires may, may become distorted and we begin to long for what we shouldn't long for. The distorting effect of sin is like having a desire to be clean, a, a want to be clean, and you go to a mirror to see the parts of your body that you need to clean, the, the part of your face that you, that you need to cleanse, for lack of better words. And when you get to, a, get to the mirror, there's a spot in that mirror. And as you look at that spot, it seems like that spot is on you. And try as you may, you try and clean off that spot, you try and remove that spot, but it doesn't move because there is a distortion in the mirror. Sin is a lot like that. It distorts who we are. It distorts the way that we see ourselves. It distorts our legitimate longing. And in our effort to try and meet that longing, we begin to hurt ourselves. That spot that is on the mirror has latched itself onto a legitimate desire to be clean. And now you find yourself trying to cleanse and cleanse and cleanse to no avail. What the gospel is and what Jesus does is that he comes and he removes that spot on the mirror. And he not only removes the spot on the mirror, he comes and he meets that need for being cleansed. And the way that Jesus meets that need is not only to wipe your face clean, but he gives us a new identity. Jesus comes and he addresses that deep longing, that deep craving that we have, and he meets that need. He far surpasses that need or that longing by making us new. Where our longings and our desires were distorted by sin or were inhibited by sin, Jesus comes and just gently removes the obstruction that is sin, that we may be able to be made new and have our longings met, have our legitimate longings met. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote some profound things about how our longings connect to a deep need for God. He said basically that, if we find ourselves with a longing which nothing on earth can meet or satisfy, it may be that this earth awakened the longing and set me questing for something that is beyond the earth, something transcendent, something far greater. He tries to help us recognize our own journeys, our own pilgrimages of longings. For example, he says, where I have longed for love, I have tethered myself to someone else, tethered myself to a lover with the hope, with the desire that this lover will meet my need for love. But then I find that this person is lacking 
and is unable to fulfill my longing. And then I untether myself and I go on another journey, on another pilgrimage to find another person who will be able to love me sufficiently to deeply fill this desire for love. He calls it the dialectic of desire, where I take my desire that's awakened by something or someone and I connect it to the thing I find. And I find out in time that that thing ultimately cannot satisfy me, that ultimately that thing will disappoint me. If I find nothing on this earth that will satisfy, it begins to point me to the depth of my longing and to the transcendent need that I have and that this longing can only be met by a transcendent being. In our pilgrimages, we will find that ultimately our longings can only be met by God. Paul fully understood this. <laughs> And that's why he is so confident. He is confident that he has this deep longing that's been awakened and he has tasted of Jesus Christ and relationship with him, that he longs for the fullness of that relationship. He understands that the fullness of knowing and being known, the fullness of loving and being loved will not be fully experienced in this world because he has tasted of the, of the love that Jesus has brought to him. And he knows that though he lives or he dies, there is no lose-lose for him. He even speaks to gaining Christ even in his death. How profound. What we see in Paul is someone who has had longings satisfied in Christ. Paul in this passage speaks of a longing, a superior longing, a longing that, as I said, death cannot even quench. In verse 21, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I desire to depart, he says, and be with Christ, which is far better. That word desire, that, that word longing is the Greek word epitomia, which means a passionate longing or an earnest desire or even to covet. But because um, we have eternity in ourselves, it makes sense that we will have longings, that we will not be able to fully satisfy in this time. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And right now in our bodies, we know Jesus, but we know him partly. Paul knows Jesus, but he doesn't know him completely. And he has this full on longing to know him completely. It is this longing that keeps him confident. Along with his mission of the gospel, it is this longing and knowing that this longing will be met that keeps Paul confident, even in the face of knowing that the Caesar that he is going to appear before may have him executed. Not only is prison not a restriction for Paul, even death itself cannot keep him from being confident. He is confident in his mission on earth and he is confident because of his longing for eternity. He is confident that this longing for eternity will be satisfied as he clearly states that for him to die is gain because he will gain Christ. It's all Christ for him. This spectrum of time and life here on earth is Christ for him and he will live out the mission and be fruitful, but even if his life should end, that too is Christ for him because he will gain in the fullness of relationship with Jesus. Paul shows us here just a beautiful understanding of mission and purpose, or ultimate purpose, let me say. He shows us just a beautiful marriage of missiology and eschatology, mission and how everything ends. Paul's life is encompassed, is, is tethered around Jesus in that in his life, he will live for Christ. And in his death, he will be in Christ. 
And these two things together, not one without the other, not a fatalistic, may it end, I want to escape, not that, but a knowing that I will gain Christ, nor a purpose, uh, or a drive that is so overwhelming that if you should lose your supposed reason or purpose that you're unable to carry on. Paul understands that his mission is encompassed in Jesus and his whole life, even in his, even his life in eternity, is under the umbrella of Christ. The gaining of Christ gives Paul perspective in his living for Christ. So as we looked at the scripture, we, we have answered two questions unintentionally. And these are the two questions. One, why am I here? And there is no person on this earth who doesn't wrestle with this question. And the second is, where am I going? The answer to these two questions allows us to be both confident in life and in death. Why am I here? I am here because as a Christian, I have a mission and that mission is Christ and Christ's mission. Christ has become our reason. He has become our purpose and has become our mission. Where am I going? Christ has become our door into eternal life. No one can get to the Father except through him. So if you lack a meaningful reason to live, Christ is your answer. If you are unsure about your eternity, Christ is your answer. It may be that you are struggling to be confident. And culture has... <laughs> many suggestions as to how you can gain more confidence. The kind of confidence that we need cannot be remedied by the right person loving us or the right amount of people liking our status on Instagram or the uh, power poses that we learn or the right clothes or the right relationships. There is such a deep desire in you for a sure thing, for a sure confidence. And I want to show you that Jesus is that solid confidence. He is that solid rock upon which you can build your life. It is one thing to have a mission on this side of the earth that is not connected to your eternity. It is another thing to have a mission on this side of the earth that is directly correlated to your eternity. It is this kind of life that will be a confident life. It is this kind of life that will overflow with joy and confidence even through difficult circumstances. So, I want to pray for you. If you want to build your life in such a way that you can be confident now and forevermore, I want to invite you to welcome Jesus into your heart. Welcome him to come and be the solid rock that you can build your career, your family, your hopes, your dreams upon. Come and allow him to be a partner with you. Come and allow yourself to be a partner with him in his mission because it is his mission that is superior and is eternal and is able to be succinct now and be able to be succinct even in eternity. There is nothing that we can dream of, that we can latch our longings to, that will be sufficient to speak to the eternity in us. The only thing that is sure is Jesus. So God, I pray for every person listening who is feeling that longing awakened in them. I pray, Jesus, that they would right now in this moment, 
receive you in their hearts and in their lives. Pray along with me, Jesus, I receive you as the solid rock upon which I want to build my life. Come and be my reason. Come and be my door. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for this message. I trust that it was beneficial for you. Two quick announcements as we end off. The first is if you would like to be a part of a community where you can learn and grow and increase your capacity to know God and make him known, you need to get into a connect group. So please go ahead and click on the link below and someone will get a hold of you in the week to transition you into a connect group should you desire. The second is that if you want to take your next steps in the faith, we have a class called Pathways. Pathways happens every Sunday. So go ahead and click that link in the message box or find the link in the bottom of this video in YouTube and we will get a hold of you and plug you in to Pathways. So as we end, I want to bless you in this way. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. To you are power, mighty one. For you are high upon the throne. And all your people stand in awe. Of love and mercy you have shown. To you I bow, Almighty One. For you are high upon the throne. Let all the people stand in awe. Of love and mercy you have shown.